All right, so, so I'll start um, with my presentation. So thank you so much for the introduction and, uh, and I'm uh, excited to talk to you about some of our work. So uh, I wanted to start with a high level view of what I mean by um, unsupervised learning. And I know that many of you uh, probably know this, but uh, when we think about machine learning, uh, we often think about, uh, you might think about a classifier or a regressor, which is which has some training, uh, trained data with labeled data. Um, and we want to kind of you know, do some tasks with it. But in genomics and in many of the problems that we are interested in, we don't actually know anything about uh, uh, labels. And we want to be able to try to identify uh, the structure and patterns from the data that should uh, uh, lead to interesting and important uh, discoveries. Uh, and here I'm like, you know, showing you some examples of these unsupervised learning uh, problems and, you know, data integration, like graph learning and clustering, dimensionality reduction are all examples of unsupervised learning. And in uh, my group, we have been uh, largely focusing on these three major directions of research, and many of them are actually, um, we are leveraging tools from uh, unsupervised machine learning to look at these problems. So one problem that we uh, work a lot on is mapping gene regulatory networks from both bulk and single cell data with different types of uh, you know, designs. And I'm happy to talk about different aspects of that. Another direction that we've been looking at in collaboration with actually Mike uh, Wilson and Jennifer Mitchell uh, is to look at a three organization and, uh, and a third direction is to um, uh, examine the question of evolution of uh, regulation and gene regulatory networks, also in collaboration with Mike and Jennifer. So uh, my talk today is going to focus on these two aspects. Uh, the first part of the talk will focus on how we can look at uh, 3D genome organization and dynamics of 3D genome organization. And the second part will be about defining gene regulatory networks. So uh, as uh, you might know, uh, the genome, uh, the DNA is a really long molecule and it's packaged inside the nucleus and how the DNA is actually organized is, um, is um, the information how the DNA is organized is very uh, important and there are multiple levels at which uh, the DNA is organized and this can have uh, major impacts on different types of uh, normal as well as disease processes and there are different levels at which they're organized. And at the coarsest level, we have compartments, the A and B compartments, which are often associated with active and repressive parts of the genome. Uh, then at a, a slightly higher resolution, we have things called topologically associating domains and subtags. Then finally, at the highest resolution are loops, which are basically low pairs of loci that uh, come together in three-dimensional space and uh, can have activating or repressive uh, 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 regulatory roles. So, um, and, uh, and so 3D genome has been an important layer of gene regulation and there are many different assays to try to uh, look at 3D. Among the popular assays is called HiC, and this is a plot from the 4D nucleome, and you can see that there are different types of assays, but HiC is one of the popular assays that has been used to try to measure genome-wide uh, whether two pairs of loci are in close proximity. And over here is a matrix, which is for all the chromosomes. And you can see that this is a, a all uh, uh, loci versus all loci interaction map. And um, basically the intensity in this uh, matrix corresponds to the strength of uh, the pro proximity of two pairs of regions to interact. And you can look at this and find little uh, regions like tads or uh, loops and, and so on. And um, because of like efforts from consortia as well as different uh, labs, people have tried to look at this question of uh, how the 3D genome actually changes and uh, what does it actually impact. And in many cases, people have shown that it has an impact on disease, on uh, normal processes like development and across evolutionary timescales, uh, the 3D genome can change and it can have a, a strong uh, phenotypic effect. So, um, so one question that we've been uh, looking at is this uh, question of how to systematically study changes in the 3D genome organization. 
So at a high level, what might we want to ask about? So the first question is, what is the unit of change? So one can look at change at the level of loops, the level of uh, topologically associated domains or compartments. And then once we know what we want to look at, we want to find those units and then compare them. So, uh, and there have been a couple of uh, few methods, uh, not to the extent to which uh, methods have been developed to look at like, you know, uh, data from one condition. Uh, so these are a pair of methods that I've listed and uh, mo the majority of these methods tend to look at pairs of conditions. Mm -hmm. And what we really wanted to do is uh, develop a, a, a computational tool that can be more gen generic and can be looked at, um, can be used to look at uh, high C matrices across multiple conditions. And in particular, uh, these conditions may have some information about how they are related. So what I want to tell you about is a method that we are developing uh, with, um, so this is uh, Erica, she's a grad student in my group, and she, it's, it's a method that she's developed. She calls it TGIF. She has a knack for developing methods and naming methods in a creative way. And so, um, so the, the, this method is uh, meant to uh, take in multiple high C matrices uh, that can correspond to different cell types or different uh, time points or different diseases and, uh, and some information about how these uh, different uh, matrices might be related, that is the condition that they're coming from, and then output uh, these topologically associated domains or other types of higher order organizational units such as compartments uh, from this um, uh, from uh, uh, from this method. And uh, today I'll be focusing more on the TAD aspect of things, but this method can also be applied for compartments. So the basic method that it's based on is uh, called non-negative matrix factorization. And you might have encountered non-negative matrix factorization for other tasks uh, such as for dimensionality reduction, but the general idea of NMF or non-negative matrix factorization is that you have a matrix, which is like shown in this uh, with the green rectangle, uh, um, uh, I don't know. Um, but this, uh, so this is the, our original data. And there is a lower dimensional representation, which is captured by these matrices U and V. So what NMF tries to do is it works with um, non-negative data and tries to pro 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 uh, construct these lower dimensional matrices U and V that when multiplied together will give you the original matrix to the extent that it, uh, to, to the best extent possible. So it tries to minimize this overall objective. Just to uh, tell you a little bit more, uh, NMF um, has, uh, you know, been used for doing something called um, um, matrix completion. And this is a, a very, uh, I would say, poster child example of trying to explain NMF. So let's say that you had a matrix of movies along the rows and, uh, and people along the columns, and each of these entries correspond to a rating that a person gives to movies. And we know that you know, people tend to hang together and form these social groups, and let's assume that there are two groups of people and they tend to watch similar types of movies. So, uh, if there is this kind of a structure where there are these green uh, group of people and the pink group of people, what NMF will be able to do is e extract out these uh, two, uh, two uh, aspects. Um, and then the other nice thing about NMF is that it also gives you this correspondence between uh, the, the groups of movies and the groups of people that go together. So, so that's the basic ingredient to our approach, but we actually have these matrices for multiple conditions that are related by this kind of a uh, hierarchy. And what we want to do is leverage this information. And so what we've done is basically applied the NMF in a multi-task setting. So basically each of the NMF, each of the tasks are uh, corresponding to the different matrices that we've been given. And we want to uh, get a low dimensional projection for each of these matrices. And uh, and we try to uh, try to basically optimize this objective. So let me just walk you through that a little bit. So uh, what we have are, let's say in this example, three different conditions for each of those conditions, we have a high C matrix. And for each of the conditions, we want to get a low dimensional representation by trying to optimize this objective. And we also want to do it simultaneously for each of our tasks, which is one, two, and three. 
and and we want to do that while also minimizing the differences between the so in this case you are trying to minimize the the v's which is a, one of the dimensions um such that two matrices that are close together or two conditions that have similar low dimensional space than things that are more further apart and then alpha is a regularization term that controls the extent to which uh, the um uh, the regularization, uh, the extent to which you want to impose this sharing of information. So that's the general idea of TGIF to solve this, uh, try to detect, uh, try to analyze these high C matrices across multiple conditions by using this multitask learning framework. And once we've gotten these projections, that is the U's or the V's, um, and this is a symmetric matrix, so we can use either of these, um, we can use that to actually identify uh, where there have been significant shifts in the uh, in the um, um, in the assignment of a particular region in these low dimensional representations, and we can use that between two pairs of regions, um, two uh, consecutive pairs of regions, and find places where there has been a significant change in the uh, in this uh, in, in the low dimensional space, and use that as a way to call a boundary. And once you have a boundary, we can get uh, what are these uh, topologically associating domains. And uh, so, uh, and the way we do this, uh, we want to also say whether something is significant. We uh, define these boundaries, and then we ask whether it's a significantly high boundary or a low boundary by generating a background um, um, distribution of these boundary scores. And then um, basically when we have these significant uh, boundary scores, the, uh, once we have that, then we can look across the different cell lines and get things like, uh, specific boundaries like task specific or context specific boundaries as well as shared boundaries. So uh, so the first thing we did was to try to do some simulations to see how well we are able to recover boundaries both shared and specific. And so this is uh, the structure of the simulation. So we start with a, um, a, a, a matrix that had uh, this kind of a structure with 40, 66 and 65 tags and then we a simulated data with different splits and merges. And then what we observe is really data at these four nodes, but we know that they are related by this kind of a tree. And then we assessed how well we did uh, based on the recovery of the tad boundaries that were specific to each task. And uh, along the basically um, pairs of tasks and they differ based on the number of boundaries that are there between them. And what you're seeing here is an F score. So F score is a basically um, a, a harmonic mean of precision and recall. And so the higher the F score, the better is the performance. And what we see is that um, as far as um, shared boundaries are concerned, uh, and here we are comparing TGIF, we are comparing CAD compare, which is one of the methods that I mentioned, and another baseline method. So that would be where you call, you apply an existing CAD finding method, and then ask, uh, do a comparison as a post-processing step to figure out whether there were, uh, what was different or similar. And what we see is that uh, the method, um, um, our method is comparable as far as the shared boundaries are concerned to this baseline method. But when it comes to finding boundaries that are specific to each task, we are able to do a much better job in terms of F score. And the reason the F score is high is uh, largely because um, while this other method is able to do a good job of recovering TADs, also recovers a lot of false positive uh, boundaries that are um, um, that are likely noise. So our, our method by sharing information across different tasks, we are able to recover what we think are more reliable boundary uh, that are specific to each of the different conditions, which is important to identify differential boundaries. That was simulated data. We've been applying this method to uh, different types of data sets, publicly available data sets, um, and as well as uh, some data sets we generated in Mike's uh, group. And so, um, so I'm going to tell you about the application of this uh, method to a particular data set which was measuring uh, high C and also other um, uh, histone modifications during a differentiation of uh, HESCs to uh, cardiomyocytes. So, uh, so um, what you're seeing here are just some statistics um, along the y-axis are the number of regions uh, or the number of boundaries that we find in any task. And then over, uh, over time, what we see across time, we see 
about 10,000 boundaries, about 10th of that is uh, task specific. So uh, we looked at the extent to which these TAD boundaries are actually, the extent to which they actually change. And so what you're seeing here, each of these numbers correspond to uh, a jacquard coefficient that, uh, that calculates how much, how shared are the boundaries between, the, between uh, every pair of time points. And what we see is that there's a gradual uh, progression. So basically pairs of time points that are more close to each other have more uh, shared boundaries. But um, at, until we reach day 80, where things are least similar between like day 15 and day 80, and day 80 is also quite far apart. So all of this kind of makes sense. We expect this to be a gradual process. And, um, and, that, um, and we see that at this level. Uh, the other question we looked at was now that we've identified differential boundaries, to what extent does that relate to changes in gene expression? So we looked at, again, pairs of time points and we identified uh, pairs of genes that were differentially expressed um, using DEC. And we find that between all pairs of time points, we see a nice enrichment of differentially expressed genes. So genes that are differentially expressed tend to be associated with differential boundaries which was interesting because there's a little bit of a debate as to whether changes in TAD uh, are actually associated with changes in gene expression, but we see that in this system, there is indeed a, a nice signal. And here's an example of a particular gene. This is actually a uh, uh, link RNA, and uh, it also overlaps with a, uh, uh, these uh, um, endogenous retro retroviruses, uh, which have been shown to be important for uh, establishing the embryonic stem cell state, and this ESRG gene is a particular marker for the uh, pluripotency state. And what we see is that it's it's highly expressed. So this is the RNA seq trap. It nicely sits at this uh, different uh, this boundary, which is present only in the embryonic stem cell state, but is no longer there in the uh, other uh, time point. Um, and, um, you know, we wanted to basically further characterize our boundaries and differential boundaries. So the next thing we looked at was to see whether these boundaries that we identify uh, are there. So we know that, you know, there are factors like CTCF, uh, which are like major architectural proteins that are, play an important role in establishing boundary structure or, or the TAD structure. But we wanted to see if there were other things that we could find and what does that tell us about this system. So what we did was uh, we obtained uh, accessibility data, which was available as part of, uh, which was available only for the embryonic stem cell state, and also uh, histone modifications, uh, which I'm not showing you here, but in a subsequent slide you'll see. And we overlapped motif binding sites with these peaks, and then we asked whether our boundaries were enriched for binding sites of different transcription factors. And this is for the embryonic stem cell state. And this is what you're seeing is these accessible motifs for these specific transcription factors tend to be uh, enriched in boundaries uh, for the embryonic stem cell state. So we see things that make a lot of sense like CDCF and then YY1, and then also other factors that we've seen have uh, that have been, uh, have some kind of architectural role. Uh, we see that uh, showing up in, in this system. Um, and then we wanted to do something similar for the other time points. We didn't have accessibility for the other time points. So instead, what we did was we used uh, H3K27 acetylation as a proxy. And so what we're doing is we're basically filtering motifs based on their presence overlap with uh, H3K27 acetylation. Uh, sorry, there should be a K over here. This is K, uh, H3K27 acetylation. And... Um, and what you're seeing here are the top 10 uh, regulators or transcription factors that show up at each of these time points. And here, actually, interestingly, it was a different set of regulators. We didn't see CTCF ranking, but several of these regulators have a very generic role and uh, in uh, have a developmental role. Some of them are actually um, cardiomyocyte related. And several that I'm highlighting in red have some expression or role in heart-related development, but we also see other lineage-specific regulators. So that was an interesting uh, kind of a finding. Um, and then beyond that, we are also using these TAD boundaries to try to characterize uh, genetic variants. And so we overlapped our TAD boundaries with uh, uh, SNPs that have been identified in different uh, GWAS studies. And here I'm focusing on SNPs identified in cardiovascular uh, these GWAS um, um, 
uh, 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 GWAS. And uh, what we find is that the SNPs are uh, enriched in these boundaries. Um, and this is an example that sits at, again, a differential boundary and this particular SNP that um, is not very, uh, actually it's not close to a gene. Um, it, uh, it was not associated with a gene in the original study. And this was identified in this study, which looked at a different, um, a particular type of phenotype in cardiovascular disease. So still we are looking at this data, and uh, but, it, uh, but we want to basically use this as a way to look at uh, dynamics and extensions of, we are thinking about extensions of this approach to look at um, across species, how things change and how things stay the same. So just to summarize the first part of my talk, what I talk, told you about is uh, to try to come up with ways to uh, systematically compare 3D genome organization. And the way we are doing this is by using a multitask framework where uh, we are doing a dimensionality reduction based on NMF. And then that helps us to identify find more reliable differential boundaries. And um, the TADS boundaries, uh, differential boundaries are enriched for differential expressed genes. And then the, the SNPs also tend to be enriched in these different boundaries. So that is my the first part of my talk. And before I jump into the second part of my talk, I wonder if people have any questions. Okay, so if maybe there are no other questions, then we can move to the next part of my talk, which is about gene regulatory networks, which is something that I've been passionate about for many years. And in particular, with the emergence of single cell data, this has become an even more exciting direction. And the, the thing that I wanted to talk today about was really trying to define GRNs in cell phase specification. So here's a, like a little Waddington landscape, and we know that you know there are changes at the underlying gene regulatory network that are associated with cells differentiating or also reprogramming. And we want to know what these networks are because in most situations, we don't know what they are. So what is a GRN? I know many of you already know this, and the ones that I'm going to talk about are transcriptional GRNs where the key players are transcription factors, maybe some signaling proteins, and we like to depict them as these directed graphs that go from these hypothetical transcription factors X1 and X2 to a target gene Y. And uh, we, we are very interested in this because they are, uh, we think of them as control machineries of cells. They define what gene should be, get, should be expressed when and where uh, to a great extent. So, uh, and when we think about uh, GRNs, gene regulatory network or regulatory interaction, it, uh, it can be useful to think about uh, two, two different versions of this. So one type of interaction, often we can think of that as cis interactions, are those that are mediated by proteins like transcription factors that bind to promoters or enhancers and then mediate the expression of a gene. And you, know, you might get these long range interactions. And so I'm going to refer to them as cis interactions. And then the other type of interaction are those that are mediated by changes in the activity or the expression level of the regulator, like transcription factors and genes. And in some way, the trans, and I call them trans interactions, and the trans actually, in a way, subsumes the cis interactions. Uh, so we would have to have the cis interactions to uh, facilitate the trans interactions. But when we think about trans interactions, we may also think about signaling proteins that also co vary or predict the expression of a gene and affect the expression of a gene. So, um, um, so, so just to keep that in our heads, um, now coming back to the question of defining GRNs on cell lineages, what are the key questions that we want to address to try to define these GRNs? So the first question is, uh, so we are thinking about uh, GRNs for cell phage specification. And so the first question is, what are the cell types? Second question is, how are they related? So what is their lineage structure? And then how do the GRNs change? And then how accurate are the GRNs? I'll not really talk about how accurate they are or like questions of uh, cell types, maybe a little bit how they're related. Largely focus on what is uh, the GRN, what are their individual GRNs, and then how do they actually change? And all of this I'm going to talk about in the context of a collaboration uh, with uh, Rupa Sridharan, who is a, a stem cell biologist. Uh, and she studies this process of cellular reprogramming, where she takes uh, these embryonic blast, mouse embryonic fibroblasts, and then reprograms them into pluripotent uh, cells. And 
one of the big questions in our lab is to make this process more efficient. So they've developed different optimization protocols and uh, uh, different ways in which trying to make this process more efficient so that it is faster and we can get more reprogrammed cells. And so for in this system, we have uh, RNA-seq, single cell RNA-seq and also single cell attack-seq over time. And our goal is to try to define the transcriptional changes and also the GRN level changes that happen that, that are associated with this reprogramming. And this is again, different team members from her group and uh, people from my group. So, uh, so going back to the picture about like, you know, what do we mean by GR interaction in a gene regulatory network? So let's focus on this first question of CIS. Um, and so here, what we did was we largely focused on first the accessibility data. And what you're seeing here is an analysis that was done using this method called Archer. And uh, you're seeing basically the sample. These are the different um, uh, uh, samples. The numbers here correspond to the different samples. So A2S was one of the conditions, uh, reprogramming conditions. FPS is another condition and the day timestamp. And then these are the different clusters. And what we see is that the ESC, IPSC cluster together, the MEFs cluster together. So it's, uh, it, may, uh, it, not, it looks uh, uh, different on the, uh, and it makes sense uh, because we expect that their chromatin landscape should be very different. And when we look at the ex uh, accessibility of different marker genes like PAL5F1 or OCT4, we see that in, um, in the ESC state, uh, they are OCT4 is very accessible, whereas markers of MEFs uh, tend to be more associated with the, um, um, with the MEF state. Uh, and then using Archer, we can get uh, different peaks. And this is uh, the clustering of Archer peaks. And we can see uh, so along the rows are different cell clusters and their different sample composition is at the bottom with this bar plot over here. And what we see is that you know, these peaks ex exhibit these uh, interesting patterns where they are present in one group of cells and absent in the other group of cells. So for example, this kind of a peak, which was largely present in the pluripotency cell cluster, uh, not present everywhere else, anywhere else. And so the question that uh, is of interest is, uh, and so these are genome-wide peaks, what does it actually, what do these peaks regulate? So here, um, what we've been doing is, uh, again, trying to use co-accessibility as a way to link distal enhancers or distal uh, candidate enhancers to genes. So here again, we are using a dimensionality reduction approach. However, instead of, so just to back up, what we are doing is this idea of trying to uh, link a region to a gene based on their uh, co-varying patterns of accessibility. However, if you do this at just the individual single cell level, it's too noisy. So instead, what we're doing is we are aggregating the data, but how do you aggregate what's the right resolution? Uh, so what we've done is again, applied a, a small sparse NMF to try to get a large number of clusters. So here we've uh, increased K to something like 60 or 70, and then use that as uh, uh, to generate uh, meta clusters and then um, uh, sorry, to generate cell clusters and then use that to get um, pseudobulk and then do prediction tasks. Um, and so it's kind of supervised and also unsupervised. Uh, it's supervised in the sense that we are actually predicting accessibility of a gene as a function of accessibility of other regions, but it's also the output of this. You're going to interpret it to infer a network that is going to link these enhancers, a candidate enhancers to genes. We've tried different uh, regression-based frameworks. The random forest uh, regression approach was what we decided to go with. And uh, our approach is what we call it as sc -Sysint for single cell cis interactor predictor. So from sc -Sysint, what we get are these random forest uh, important scores that we further filter based on Archer and then we uh, then uh, rank it uh, based on importance and uh, some Archer key value and then some other filtering based on other histone marks and uh, dynamics across the reprogramming time course. And we find there are 17 regions that we are now uh, following up with experimental assays. And I'm going to tell you about one of these. So one of these is uh, what uh, it, we call it the FA1 locus. Uh, and uh, what you're seeing here is an archer track. So this is the peak that is of interest. And it's a peak that is uh, lower in the MEFs, but is uh, present in the ESC, IPSC state. 
and also in the later time points of the FPS. So we think this is a peak that is really uh, associated with uh, uh, the um, establishment of pluripotency, uh, but uh, but it's somehow uh, uh, correlated with that. And uh, uh, we've also like you know tried to uh, annotate these peaks by using uh, an, a framework that we are trying to look at uh, that looks at like dynamics, so it tries to annotate uh, regions based on their overall shifts in chromatin state. And so this particular peak also gets assigned a dynamic state. And then what we've done is we've applied SCSINT and um, sorry, so I'm going to tell you about the prediction that we get from SCSINT. So what I'm showing you here are two genes, HSPB6 and LSR, which SCSINT predicted to be uh, targets of this particular uh, locus. And uh, just as a sanity check, we looked at whether the, the extent to which they are actually co-accessible. And you can see that there's a pretty good uh, agreement. So on the y-axis is hsbb 6s accessibility and the x-axis is um, the other locus. And uh, what we want to do is now see whether these interactions actually make sense. So together in Rupa's lab, what she's doing is um, she's actually using CRISPR-I to suppress or target this locus, and then we are trying to validate this by measuring these uh, different types of assays like K9, ME3, uh, extent of reprogramming, and then gene expression. Um, and this is the timeline, just to give you a sense of when we are uh, basically targeting the cells and then when we are actually collecting the data. And what you see here is the result of this uh, validation experiment. And we see that uh, this is a sanity check. So a K9ME3 chip qPCR shows that this particular locus has a lot of K9ME3. And then when we measure, we see there's an increase in reprogramming efficiency. And when we, um, uh, when we look at the expression of the genes, we see there's a significant change and it's a significant down regulation of gene expression. That is uh, promising. To uh, it shows that uh, the predicted targets do have a significant impact in gene expression, uh, and then we are still interpreting this data. So it seems like there's a, a repressive kind of an eff uh, effect. Um, uh, so, um, but it, it was in, in, uh, it was promising. Happy to hear what other people might have. I'm going to pause and see if there are questions. But I see that I'm kind of running low on time. Um, are there questions? Kind of concludes maybe the second part of my talk and then the rest is uh, uh, more interactions but using a different approach. Any questions yet? Cool. Let's maybe continue there. Okay, yeah. So that was the cis level. And then, uh, you know, the other aspect of uh, inferring networks is the trans interactions. And here we are taking. Uh, uh, something, that, uh, an approach that people have uh, taken, you know, uh, uh, a while ago. But the, but basically, this is the task of um, uh, again, like you know, taking an input matrix. Uh, so this is like network inference one hundred one. And the what we are saying is that we have a measurement. We have this giant matrix, and the uh, and each of these entries correspond to some gene expression level. And there is a hidden network that we want to infer uh, from the data. And we and we want to be able to find the model, and the model takes form of a network. And we want to do this uh, by uh, op by um, optimizing the overall uh, uh, ability to explain this overall data. So this is an example, another example of unsupervised learning. And the key tasks that we want to do solve is uh, this uh, structure learning and uh, parameter learning problems. Um, and this is, has been uh, basically an approach in, in the field when people have measured gene expression and had sufficient sample size, and there are many approaches out there. And um, with the emergence of single cell data, this has become again an exciting problem to think about where uh, now um, what we have is uh, genes again on the rows, but along the columns, we have individual cells. And then we can feed in different network inference algorithms. And there are several different algorithms that are out there um, that use just gene expression. And if you're interested, I encourage you to check out these two reviews. And also benchmarking studies, including one from our group, where people have tried to compare different network inference algorithms. The problem, however, with network inference uh, with single cell data so far is that, especially when you're thinking about it on a system 
where you have this kind of a lineage and multiple cell populations, most methods basically ignore how the cell clusters are related. That is, they treat this as a single task learning problem, but uh, what we um, and the other challenge is that they've largely relied on single cell rna seq data. And, um, uh, and so to overcome that, what we've done is we've, uh, we've developed a method called SCMTNI. And here again, you'll see this flavor of multitask learning where we are taking single cell RNA-seq, but here the tasks are different cell clusters and we have RNA-seq, single cell RNA-seq matrices for each of these cell clusters. And if you have accessibility data, then you can add that and out of uh, the output of this method is for each cell cluster, a, G, a gene regulatory network. Um, and the way we use the accessibility uh, very briefly is really to uh, impose uh, cell type specific priors, but but if you don't have accessibility data, or if you have only bulk accessibility data, you can still use it. It may not be cell type specific, but what we, what we want to emphasize is that accessibility alone is not going to give you a GRN. It will give you a structure, it'll, it, it, and it's better to use it as a prior and then leverage expression together to inform a final uh, graph structure that is uh, incorporating not only uh, those uh, regulators for which you have motif information, but also regulators for you may, for which you may not have that, and um, and uh, um, and help you to learn a more complete uh, gene regulatory network. The way we do this is by putting it inside a uh, probabilistic framework. But I'll skip that for now. The preprint is available. If you're interested, you can check it out. Just wanted to just show you again. We do simulations, and on simulations, we see that uh, when we uh, and here we compare. Uh, different uh, multitask learning methods as well as single task learning methods. And we find that multitask learning definitely has an advantage when uh, there is this relatedness across different cell types. I'm kind of, it's almost four o'clock, but I'll try to tell you quickly about how, what we are learning by applying this system, applying this method. This is a general workflow. So Rupa's data is unpaired, as in like it's not multi or single cell multi -ohm. So we have RNA measured separately as uh, and our attack measured separately. And we've applied it to not only her system, but also two other publicly available data sets with hematopoiesis. Um, there's a lot of hematopoiesis data that's out there, but if the other data sets that you are interested and know of where there's a, like a temporal aspect and there is a RNA and attack, we would be very happy to try to try out our approach. Um, and so, uh, so the overall uh, workflow is where we use uh, an existing uh, data integration approach. We use LIGER, which was pretty good in terms of integrating RNA and attack. And what we get out of integrated cell clusters, we feed that through a minimum spanning tree learning uh, framework. So we infer, we, uh, we use a minimum standard approach to represent a linear structure, then we feed that into network inference, and then we get networks out. Um, what you're seeing here are the result of the integration. So these are the LIGA clusters on the left with integration uh, being clear with the uh, embryonic stem cells. So these are the samples. Again, we see the attack and the RNA together, the MEFs again together. Um, this is more clear in this uh, figure where we have cell clusters along the ro uh, rows and then the number of attack cells and the number of uh, RNA cells. And then along the columns, you can see that um, the distribution of the different samples um, in each of these different clusters or how the samples themselves are distributed across the clusters. And you can see that the MEFs are in cluster C4, both for RNA and attack, and the ESCs are in cluster C5. Um, and so, uh, so then our um, planning tree approach basically gave us this kind of a tree. So C4 is, uh, the, uh, is the MEF and we call it the starting uh, point. And then C5 is the end point that we want to get, but we see a fork where basically some of the cells go on this trajectory and basically these are the ones that don't reprogram uh, very well. And we want all the cells to actually become reprogrammed. So of course the natural question is why do these cells not reprogram? Uh, oh, sorry, why, why do these cells in C2 not reprogram? Are there differences at the GRN level that actually are uh, informative in helping us uh, think, think about this process? So that gets to the question of dynamics at GRN level. 
And here uh, we've developed uh, two approaches. I'm going to talk about one specific approach that has given us more mileage, and this is based on LDA or topic modeling. Uh, and I'm sorry that this might be going a little too fast, but if people have questions, I'm happy to answer them. But um, LDA is a, is a method that has been developed to actually cluster documents, but it has been repurposed uh, by another approach called TopicNet, and we've uh, basically adopted it for a single cell uh, GRNs. So in LDA, there are these parameters, and the idea is that a topic is defined by, uh, 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 sorry, a word, uh, sorry, a document is made up of a combination of different topics, and each topic has a distribution of different words. And um, what we want is to figure out what is the topic composition of each word, of each document, and we want to know what composition, uh, what is the distribution of words for each topic. And these are parameters that can be learned as part of the uh, training algorithm. Uh, putting it in the context of uh, a gene regulatory network, the way we do this is we basically stack up all the TFs uh, from the different cell types as different rows and the transcription factors become our documents and then the, tar and the, uh, the target genes become the words and their presence absence becomes uh, uh, basically uh, whether a word is present in a document or not. And then with LDA, we get out the topic distribution of every transcription factor for each of the cell types. And uh, we also get the, the, um, the probability with which a particular word slash target belongs to a particular topic. And then we can look at each of these transcription factors and see did the topic actually uh, change for a particular transcription factor or did it remain the same? And that can give us some rewiring things. But we can also look at each topic. So each topic is like is a group of TFs and targets. And we can see whether how much, to what extent a topic actually changes uh, across these different cell clusters. So, so basically the topics give us little sub-networks that we can map along the trajectory. So what you're seeing here is one such topic. And I'm just going to uh, zoom in into two of these. So this corresponds to one of the endpoints that we want. Each of these little blue dots corresponds to a, a, a gene or a transcription factor, and the little red arrows are regulatory edges that we are predicting. And this is the between the two endpoints. So this is C5, which is the embryonic stem cell state that we want to get to, or the pluripotency state that we want to get into. And this is the other endpoint. And what we see is that um, that there are regulators that uh, like ESRRB. Uh, and top A, top two A that have many more connections in this particular uh, population of cells, which are not there in the in these uh, in this population of cells. So we can actually use this as a way to look at rewiring changes at the GRN level, and this makes sense because we know ESRRB is a key marker and a re regulator that is needed for establishing an EAC state. Uh, um, yeah, and so uh, this is basically trying to just summarize all this information and these are other regulators and the size of the circle corresponds to the number of targets. We can see how the extent of rewiring of different regulators. We find several cell cycle and regu uh, regula regulators known to be uh, important for uh, establishing embryonic stem cell state that are in these, uh, that, uh, that, we, uh, that, that, so we think that the, the cell cycle program needs to be upregulated together with, of course, the pluripotency program. And then on the converse side, there's another topic that we see the regulators like um, AEBP1 uh, that are known to be MEF specific regulators. And uh, what, so what we see is that these regulators tend to not go away for these cells to uh, uh, not reprogram. Um, so that was uh, kind of a nice thing. And uh, right now we are trying to figure out whether we can evaluate these different regulators experimentally to see the extent to which it actually affects uh, the reprogramming status. So that pretty much concludes, concludes what I wanted to tell you. Uh, there's a lot of uh, promise with single cell RNA-seq and ATAC-seq in defining cell type specific GRNs. Um, but uh, we need to come up with uh, methods that are targeted or geared towards single cell data, especially handling heterogeneity and a population structure. And uh, so that was the SCMTNI method. And then SCC Saint was trying to, again, use single cell accessibility to try to predict these types of long range interactions. Um, and so I just wanted to just, again, this is very, well, just concluding. 
I talked about two approaches, looking at dynamics. Uh, both of them are unsupervised in nature. One was trying to do these dimensionality reductions based on NMF. The other one was trying to do this graph learning type of thing. Uh, just a concluding thought, uh, we make a lot of predictions, but validation remains challenging. All of our validations tend to be low throughput, and uh, we are interested to do more high throughput validations, but how to do it uh, together uh, with other collaborators uh, is uh, something to kind of, like, people have to be interested. So it's uh, something that we are working on. Um, and so that's pretty much it. I wanted to thank um, uh, my excellent collaborators uh, at, U at, the, uh, at Toronto, as well as at UW and my group. And I just want to put a plug for our biomedical data science program, if you're interested to pursue PhD. I don't know if, if there are undergrads, in the audience, or if you know people, please ask them to check out our biomedical data science program. And that's it, and I'm, I'm done. <laughs>